Romans chapter 1 is where we are as we get into really the substance of Paul's letter to the Romans for the first time. He says in verse 15, so for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Ever say that to anyone? <laughs> ever, ever had anyone say that to you? You should be ashamed of yourself. Or maybe, have you no shame? What is shame? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Depends, I guess, on the context. Uh, depends on what you mean by the word shame as well. My online dictionary says this, shame is the painful feeling arising from the consciousness of something dishonorable or improper or ridiculous done by oneself or by another. And I, I find that interesting, that some of us feel shame because of something someone else did with whom we share some particular association. We feel ashamed because of, I don't know, what our parents did or a child does, or maybe a fellow Christian. It, may, it might even be something from a century ago. But some of us are susceptible to borrowed shame, as it were. Big difference, I think, between something that I clearly did myself and something that someone else did. But the shame that is associated, associated with personal guilt, now that, that we have all felt, haven't we? You got caught losing your temper. You got caught telling a lie. Oof. You got caught gossiping. When those kind of things happen, shame is actually a good thing, isn't it? Sociopaths, <laughs> they don't deal with shame, do they? They get caught in a lie, and they just tell another bolder lie, a feeling of shame is simply an indicator that you still have an active conscience. But as we mature, I think we discover that our shame mechanisms can get distorted. Some may be lacking an appropriate sense of shame, but we may also feel shame for things that we should feel shame or should not feel shame over. Certain people in your life may try to use shame in a manipulative way. They, they call you names. Ah, you, you're a homophobe or a transphobe or a bigot or a racist or a legalist. They, they put blame on you. They toss some shame in your direction, hoping that you'll own it and adjust your behavior to meet their expectations. So your shame can become a lever of control for someone else. Parents use it. Kids use it. Siblings will use it. Pastors use it. Political leaders certainly use it. Whole societies will use shame to adjust and to, to amend the behavior of people. The sensitive believer sometimes gets confused about when to embrace shame and when to reject the shame. Apparently, our friend, the Apostle Paul, was aware of the temptation to wrongly and unwisely embrace the shame. He was a man who sold himself out to preach the message of Jesus Christ throughout the world as he knew it. Did anyone try to make Paul feel shame for what he believed and for what he proclaimed? Oh my, yes, they did. They accused him of disloyalty to his Jewish heritage, of betraying the law of Moses, of being a stupid, gullible fool who believed nonsense, and to add insult or injury to insult, they threw stones at him from time to time and accused him before the Roman courts and before the Jewish leaders uh, and the Roman leaders and the Gentile leaders. All, they all took their shots at trying to shut Paul up by inducing in him a sense of shame over what he was doing. So when Paul says, I am 
not ashamed. There is a context for that. Lots of folks were trying to convince him he should be ashamed. So the opening lines of the epistle of Romans alert us that the letter is going to be focused on this thing that we call the gospel. The Greek word is euangelion or evangel. It is found in chapter 1 of Romans six times. It is called in this chapter the gospel of God of which Paul is not ashamed, but instead, as he said in verse 15, he is eager to preach it in Rome and anywhere that he would be allowed (coughs) to preach it. And after some introductory remarks, Paul begins the body of his letter to the Romans here in verse 16 with this line about not being ashamed. And I can't explain with confidence why he does that, but it has become a favorite verse for many of us. And you may have noticed it's our memory verse uh, for the month because we can relate to the temptation to shrink back, to not claim this gospel, to not proclaim this gospel. I feel that reluctance. Do you? I went to the University of Florida, and uh, it was not a Christian college. No, no. Even, even then, the person who stood for biblical sexual ethics was considered backwards. The claim to have absolute truth that was binding on all persons and all cultures, well, that, that view or that understanding was simply scoffed at, unsophisticated. And if we spoke of a creator... What? We may as well be a flat earther. Disdain is what we tend to get from the power brokers of our world. And so because I prefer to be thought well of, yeah, because I prefer to be esteemed, I prefer to be accepted and liked, there is a resident voice within me telling me I had better not let my Christian convictions be known. Not in certain context. Am I the only one here like that? (laughs) Uh, Paul is about to spend the next seven chapters explaining to us why we have no reason for shame over the gospel and every reason for boasting in it. It is well that we immerse our minds and hearts in what he has to say, and the main point he will make is that this gospel, which many despise, is in fact the most powerful thing in the world. Andre, you might want to turn me down a little bit. I might get excited here. Uh, It is the most powerful thing in the world. It is God's power for eternal salvation. It is what can make a dead man live. It is what can make a blind woman see. It is what can turn a lost sinner into a confident saint. Paul says it is the power of God unto salvation. Elsewhere, he said this, 1 Corinthians 1.18, the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, what is it? Say it with me. It is the power of God. Foolishness to some, no doubt. It includes this ridiculous claim that that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. It suggests that a a dying man, a man dying a criminal death in Palestine 2,000 years ago, that that's what rescues us here in western Pennsylvania in 2022. And these are not things that one readily believes. It isn't surprising that most in our world think our message to be bizarre. Their view is Really, it's easy to understand. What is not so understandable is the view of the gospel that you and I share. I mean, we seem seem like reasonable, intelligent people. We are able to function in the world. Many of us got advanced degrees. How did it come to be that we hold these fanciful notions contained in the gospel? How'd that come to be? It is because we experienced its power. We experienced its power. If you brought into your home someone who had never been around modern appliances, had no acquaintance with electricity even, and you told them that if they put their water um, in a white box sitting on your counter, turned a knob or pushed some buttons, and the water would come out hot in a couple of minutes, that person would likely think that you are crazy. You can't heat up water without a fire, and yet within two minutes, that person would know differently, wouldn't they? <laughs> they would touch that hot water, they would experience the power of the microwave, and they would go from doubt to belief. They wouldn't understand the how. They can't explain how that water was heating up. 
I'm pretty sure I don't know how that water <laughs> heats up, and I've been using them for decades, but they saw it and believed it because they experienced the power of the microwave. And I'm a believer in microwaves because I've observed their work. I've also experienced the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I have seen what it has done for me and what it has done for many, many others, the author of our letter being among them. Paul, remember, he was a huge doubter. He was hostile as he could be to the message of Christ, but his mind was changed. His heart was transformed. He was transformed. He was saved by this gospel. 1 Peter 1, verse 23, he says, you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is through the living and enduring Word of God. It is the message of the gospel that God uses to give life to what was dead, to reconcile sinners to a holy God, to give hope to the hopeless, confidence even. What else can do what the gospel of Christ does? So we see that the gospel has power, but it is a specific kind of power. It is power unto salvation or for salvation. Now, what is in view here? That word salvation, especially as we encounter it in the New Testament, is rather flexible. Now, a lot of things you could be saved from. What, what, what kind of salvation is in view here? What is the salvation from? What would you say? Someone ask you that question. What is it you Christians think you're saved from? And you would say, as a Jesus believer, I am saved from blank. You got an answer in your head? I am saved from blank. If, if, if you have an answer you want to share with the rest of us, raise your hand. Come on, come on. What do you got, Deanne? Doubt. Doubt, okay. Yes, Brian. Curse. The curse, Bell. Death, Jerry. Sin. Sin, that's probably the most popular. And I guess you're back there, Don. Hell. Hell, yeah. Anything else? I am saved from, I am saved from God's wrath. Yes, Ruth. From death. A lot of great answers to that question. Salvation, like I said, it's a flexible term in Scripture. It, it's, it's, but this is more than conversion that we're talking about. It, it is all that delivers us safely into the Father's arms on the last day. Certain elements of our salvation are still in the future for us, but the gospel is always central. It is what keeps us looking to Jesus. It is what keeps us staying faithful, still believing to the end. Even now, it saves me from discouragement. It saves me from temptation. It saves me from apostasy. One commentator posted a list that I rather liked. It showed salvation's effects viewed as a negative and then as a positive with the baseline understanding that salvation saves us from sin. And on each point here, I will read the negative and you join me on the positive, okay? He writes that Jesus rescues me from sin's guilt to bring men into a state of righteousness. righteousness. Very good. He rescues from sin's pollution to bring us to holiness. He rescues us from slavery to bring us into freedom. He rescues us from punishment to bring us into a state of blessedness. Specifically on this last point, we go from alienation to fellowship, from wrath into, from death into. Is that a message to be ashamed of? Or to glory in? It is awesome. It is beautiful, and it speaks to our deepest needs. In the context of Paul's thoughts in Romans 1, the answer to what the gospel saves us from is suggested in verse 18. We will dive into that next time, but look briefly right now. For the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. When Paul thinks of being saved, it is precisely these things that come into his mind, the wrath of God which is due upon sin, here described as ungodliness or unrighteousness. And with this language, the apostle places us into the courtroom context for judgment and for redemption. God is a judge who hates and must punish human rebellion and wickedness. Our most pressing problem it can be described in many ways, but in one sense, our biggest problem, our biggest problem is God. 
He's holy. And we are unholy. He is a just judge and we are cosmic criminals. Human beings have, we have a lot of troubles. We have political troubles, relational troubles, psychological troubles, financial troubles, medical troubles. We have troubles with war and troubles with oppression and troubles with addiction, all, all of it. And the gospel will speak to these things. It does. But its core concern is on the central issue of our guilt before a holy God. Romans 5 makes this exceedingly plain. There in verse 9, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Now, there's a lot of preachers in the church and outside who have decided to focus on the other problems. But the gospel focuses on sin and wrath and the solution which has come in Jesus. So that will be our focus as we engage the letter to the Romans. Can I hear an amen on that? <laughs> so we are not ashamed of the gospel. That's point one. It is God's power. That's point two. Point three then will be this. To everyone who believes. Ah, notice it doesn't just say everyone, does it? The benefactors of this salvation, they form a subset of the human race. It is a limited group. Universalism, the teaching that everyone ultimately is saved, that is rejected it is clearly not scriptural. The gospel opposes it, but also the gospel opposes any limitation placed upon or based upon racial or ethnic groupings. The everyone could be understood by some to only include the elect nation of Israel, the Jewish people. Paul wants all to be clear that it is not so limited. The Jews, by and large, heard the gospel first. That was the appointed order, but the gospel is for people of every race and every place. But it is not saving, it is not saving for every human being, is it? The gospel discriminates. It is the power of God for salvation only to those who believe it. To most others, it is just foolishness, as we have seen. The gospel makes faith then the great dividing line between human beings. It is more important than your race. It is more important than your sex. It is more important than your nationality. It is more important than your age. It is more important than your political party or your economic class. Where do you stand on the Jesus question? Is he Lord or is he not? Do you reject him or do you trust in him? That is the all-important matter. Verse 17 says it again. Faith is that which brings life. Without faith, the gospel is of no value to you. But with faith, you get everything. Everything. All right, let's skip down. At this point, to the end of our next verse, verse 17. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. And that last phrase can be taken in a few different ways, but the best way to read it is like this. The righteous by faith will live. The prepositional phrase, by faith, modifies the righteous, not the verb live. So it means those who are righteous by faith will live. That is, eternal life is bestowed on those who discover the righteousness of God which comes through faith, not through baptism, not through law-keeping, but faith in the Son of God who died to save us from our sins. Now, you likely remember the terrible collapse of that condominium on the coast in Florida Last, last summer, it was an awful thing, in part because of the way it happened. It likely meant that a number of the people that were killed in that terrible event, those who died, probably suffered terribly before they, they uh, expired, with no one able to get to them. Similar things occurred around the collapse of the ten, Twin Towers. On, on September 11, 2001, a woman named Janelle Guzman, a 33-year-old doctor, was buried under the rubble that was the World Trade Center. Her legs and other bones were crushed. 
but she was alive, although buried. And no one found her all the first day. She fell asleep at night, but around noon the next day, she heard voices and, and she was able to cry for help. She managed also to find a hole in the rubble large enough to reach through a battered hand. Soon, she felt a hand clasp hers, and a man said, this is Paul. I've got you, and you're going to be okay. Imagine that. Now remember that we, you and I, we are buried beneath our sin, and we cannot save ourselves. We are trapped under the weight of our own guilt. But, but, like Janelle, what can we do? We can reach out a hand of faith, and we can cry for help. We reach out a hand of faith, and we cry for help. What do we mean by that little word faith? Does it mean pretending? Does it require some mystical power? Is it an irrational leap into the darkness? Charles Spurgeon put it well. He said, faith is not a blind thing, for faith begins with knowledge. It's not a speculative thing, for faith believes facts of which it is sure. It's not an unpractical, dreamy thing, for faith trusts and stakes its destiny upon the truth of revelation. Faith is the eye which looks. Faith is what? The hand that grasps. Indeed, we hear the Savior calling, and we reach out to Him. Faith is saving. Why? Because it connects us with the Savior. The pardon is His. The power is His. The righteousness is His. The merit is His. The hymn writer nails it when he says, No merit of my own, His anger to suppress. My only hope is found in Jesus' righteousness. His grace has planned it all. Tis mine but to believe. Tis mine but to believe, expressed by reaching out that hand to the Lord. So now let's talk about Martin Luther. <laughs> he was living in Germany, early 1500s. He is a brilliant, super dedicated monk who was eaten up with a personal sense of his own unworthiness. He saw that God was holy and he was not. And that gulf between him and God haunted him day and night. At the advice of a friend, he focused his questioning mind on the study of the Scriptures. One verse became especially important to him. That verse was Romans 1 and verse 17. Martin Luther said he hated it. <laughs> yeah, you heard that right. He said he hated Romans 1.17. Luther wrote this, I had been captivated with an extraordinary ardor for understanding Paul in the epistle of the Romans, but a single word in chapter 1, in it the righteousness of God is revealed, stood in my way, for I hated that word righteousness, which I had been taught is the righteousness with which God punishes the sinner. You get that? <laughs> Martin Luther thought that Paul was referring to God's own personal righteousness, his justice, out of which he condemns sinners like Martin. And that makes sense. It could certainly mean that. But in this context of Romans 1, it does not mean that. Eventually, Martin Luther's study would lead him to that conclusion. But before it did, he wrote this. He said, Thus I raged with a fierce, troubled conscience. Nevertheless, I beat upon Paul, most ardently desiring to know what Paul wanted. At last, by the mercy of God, meditating day and night, I gave heed to the context of the words, namely, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed as it is written. He who through faith is righteous shall live. And I think we have the rest of the quote on the screen. There I began to understand that the righteousness of God is righteousness with which the merciful God justifies us by faith. Here I felt I was altogether born again and had entered paradise itself 
through open gates. Martin Luther's discovery, his rebirth by the gospel, <laughs> it changed Europe in the 16th century. And it has changed my life. And I expect it has changed yours as well. He pounded on our text until he got the gospel. And the world has never been the same. So let's get clear on this before we wrap up today. The phrase, the righteousness of God, does it mean here the righteousness which adheres to God or the righteousness which comes from God? Adheres to God and to no one else or comes from God unto others? The gospel, the good news is this. It is the latter. There is a righteousness which comes from God to sinners, and that righteousness makes us clean. It makes us just. It makes us forgiven when it is received by faith. Those who are the righteous by faith have life. This is the good news. Righteousness is absolutely required of every single man or woman. Without it, we face a terrible judgment. We face an eternal death. That's the simple truth, the sad truth. Sad because we don't have any righteousness. We are morally bankrupt. Having violated God's law from our birth, Martin Luther recognized this about himself. I hope you have recognized it about yourself. That realization would lead to utter despair were it not for the gospel, which tells us that what we could never do by our own merit, we can have by the provisions of grace. We are able to reach out a hand of faith and possess a perfect righteousness which our Lord offers as His gift. Paul writes about this same reality in Philippians 3, where in verse 9, the apostle's desire is expressed that he, that he may be found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Before Paul met Jesus Christ, he was pursuing righteousness. He was pursuing a right standing before God by a careful observance of Judaic law. That is, he was trying to gain his salvation by being good, but when he met Jesus, he realized that by the works of the law, no man is justified because God's legal standard is perfection, and no man had ever been perfect except for one, that is Jesus. And the good news of the gospel is that although nothing you can do will earn righteousness, God offers the right righteousness of Christ to you as a gift which is received by faith. The righteousness of God, the righteousness that God demands from us, He provides for us. Again, Philippians 3.9 speaks of the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. The Word of God teaches that when you place your trust in Jesus, His Son, that is the Christ's perfect righteousness is accredited to your account And I can tell from your reaction that you don't believe me. <laughs> or, or you don't understand me. This is the most amazing and the most wonderful truth you will ever hear. Again, for believers in Jesus, when, the, when God the judge looks at the record of your life, instead of seeing a book full of your sin, he sees the perfection of, your, of his son, and he declares you righteous. Understand the term righteousness here does not refer to the inward quality of a person, but to one's judicial record in the court of heaven. And not only do Christians have a clean slate in heaven's court, we have been graciously supplied a credit that we can never spend out. Now that deserves at least a smile. <laughs> Any of you remember the cartoon Zitz? Zitz? Yeah, it was about a teenager named Jeremy. And he appears here with his buddy, whose name is Pierce. And Pierce says, I don't think people appreciate me for who I am. Now, that's a very common human experience. And Jeremy responds by saying, that's too bad. Who are you? And Pierce, in the third frame, speaks for the entire race. And he says, someone who needs a lot of undeserved appreciation. <laughs> Oh, I love that. <laughs> That's, that is so good. We are a people who need to be loved 
but we're unlovely. We need to be righteous, but, but we're unrighteous. We need to be accepted. We need to be appreciated, but we are unacceptable. So to get what we need, we must count on some, getting something undeserved. And we in the church call that kind of stuff what? The good stuff that comes our way that's undeserved. We call that amazing grace. grace. How sweet the sound that saved a what? A wretch like me. And he does this by taking all the badness that is mine and he gives it to Jesus. And then he takes all the goodness in Jesus and he gives it to me so that I who is dirty am now clean. I who is condemned am now free. I who is poor am now rich. I who is dead am now alive. I who was an outcast am accepted in the beloved and made like him a son or a daughter of the king. United with Jesus, you are righteous, for his name is the Lord our righteousness. This means that you're standing with God. It's, it's, not, it's not really about you. It's not about how you behave this morning. It's grounded in the merits of Christ and all of his worthiness. I'm not righteous so much as I am made righteous. And oh, my friend, if you ever grasp that, what awesome freedom you will know. You are one with your Lord, and that means everything he gets, you get. You are one who needs a lot of undeserved appreciation, especially from God. And in Christ, that is exactly what we find. Glorious. Time to think more about that around the Lord's table.